Hi everyone, my name is Amy Moiso and I'm on the pastoral staff of Westminster Presbyterian Church Nashville and I'm sitting here on my front porch with some of my plants that are outside growing in the nice spring weather and I thought that'd be a fitting start for this class that follows which is about the season of Lent and how we understand our experiences of wilderness. So I hope you enjoy it. This is part of a Lenten series that was at Westminster Presbyterian Church Nashville in 2020 and I'm happy to share it with you via this video. We were looking at different ways to imagine Lenten disciplines and we started by looking at the idea of wilderness and what does wilderness mean and how might we reimagine the ideas of wilderness in Lent. So just to review to begin with, uh, we wanted to talk a little bit about what Lenten disciplines are themselves and why do we focus on piety and repentance during Lent particularly? Well, since the beginning of the church, Lent, or these, uh, these weeks leading up to Easter, were a time of preparation for baptism. It was a time of new Christians learning about Christianity and preparing for baptism at Easter. And it became a season for everyone to sort of renew themselves um, in the Christian faith in preparation for the events of Holy Week and Easter. So as we look toward those events, uh, we think about how we want to live our lives as Christians, what we might be doing uh, or what we could do better. How are we thinking about confessing the places where we've gone wrong as we anticipate new life and new birth at the resurrection? Generally, Lenten practices tend to be focused inwardly on our personal orientation to faith and on our relationship with God. They tend to be sort of individual in that way, even though we do participate in worship and things together. The experience of Lent is often one of sort of personal piety and personal repentance. But one of the things we can think about differently is that repentance is not merely individual because it's connected to the idea of penance. And penance is about making amends. It's about fixing the things that have gone wrong and atoning for them. So when we think about the particularities of Lent, things like confession or repentance or prayer, uh, fasting, those kinds of disciplines, we should always be coupling those with the external expressions in relationship to other people, not just our relationship of, with God, but with other people. So how are we turning to one another to reconcile? How are we coming back together? And how are we fixing things that have gone wrong? How are we participating in the repair of things that have gone wrong or things that are broken in our relationships and in our world? So as we think about what a Christian discipline is or what a Christian practice is more generally, not just during Lent, here are some ways to conceptualize that. First of all, a Christian practice is something that Christian people do together over time to address fundamental human needs in response to and in light of God's active presence for the life of the world. So the idea here is that Christians together participate in in Christian practices because they see human needs around them, but they do that in response to God, to God's call to love and care for the world, and because God is active in the world. And so we partici participate in practices that bring us into alignment with that presence of God. Practices are also formational. They orient us towards God's ways of being in the world, so they help us learn more about who God is as we practice them. They deepen our knowledge of humanity, of others, and how uh, to be empathetic or compassionate toward others and toward all of creation. And they help us know better who God is and how God is active in the world. Some examples of these are things like hospitality or Sabbath, forgiveness of one another, um, discernment, trying to figure out how we are called to be faithful, testimony, bearing witness, and healing. So what comes to mind for you when you think of the word nature? As we're thinking about these themes of Lent and these themes of disciplines, what comes to mind when you think of nature? And what comes to mind when you think of wilderness? These are two different words to describe similar things, but they have strongly different um, connotations. So be thinking about those two elements together and how they're different. In the Bible, Wilderness often has negative associations. So this is a picture from the desert of Paran, which is in southern Israel. And it's a place that is pretty typical of what we think of 
from the Bible. It's a place that is pretty unsettled, non-arable, windswept. It's a place of deprivation, of hunger and thirst. It's a place where not very much grows. Stuff doesn't grow very well, so you don't want to grow crops there. You might not even want to raise sheep there. And it's also in the Bible, a place that's associated with wild beasts and with things that are scary, with echoing noises, um, and demons and people who have gone mad. So it's a place that people don't really want to go. It's a scary place in a lot of parts of the Bible. But the wilderness can also be a place of spiritual renewal and of finding God. So when we think about the Israelites who were in the wilderness with Moses after escape from Egypt, they were wandering around in the wilderness, but they also received insight from God. They received 10 commandments. They received the law. They were given guidance and direction throughout that time. So it's a place of finding, not just being lost. And of course, in the New Testament, we know about Jesus wandering or being in the wilderness for 40 days after his baptism. That's part of where we get the 40 days of Lent from. And it was a time of prayer and fasting and testing for Jesus in preparation for his ministry. But it was also a time for Jesus to find God. Um, and even he is even met by angels in the wilderness. So that means that this idea of wilderness really reflects a lot of different kinds of tensions. So it's a place of danger but it's also a place of escape. So for instance, the Israelites escape to the wilderness from slavery in Egypt. It's a place of chaos, but it's also a place of creation, of newness, where new things can be born. It's a place of desolation and also a place of salvation, of being met. It's a place of isolation and aloneness and also of connection with God and with self. So wilderness is a place where all these things happen together. So when we think of our own experience of wilderness and nature, we can think of these things too. So we might think of going away on vacation as a place of escape and creation and salvation and connection, but it's also a place of danger and chaos and desolation and isolation. Getting away from it all isn't always safe. It's sometimes a place of new and different kinds of dangers. I'm particularly afraid of poison ivy, for instance. Another way to think of it is about something like a bumblebee. Bumblebees are all around right now. It's becoming spring here in Nashville. And I see them every day now because they're flying around my porch making holes. The carpenter bees are at it and they're digging through our porch railings. So we end up with these things held together. The things that are beautiful and good and necessary like pollinators and the destruction that they cause to our porches and patios. So what we end up with are these things together, and this is what we understand to be part of wilderness. So when we think about wilderness or nature as part of our Lenten journey and as part of a spiritual discipline, we hold these things together and recognize that they go together. And the reason we think that and believe that and want to connect with that is because it reminds us that we are not separate from nature. We want to get away from it all, but in fact, we are already part of it because we are animals and we are part of the natural world. We depend on the natural world. We need the stuff of nature to survive, air and water and food, and we are all interconnected with it. So these are just some reflections to think about as we think about what is nature and what is wilderness. So... What can wilderness offer our spiritual practice in Lent? What are some ways that this concept can help feed us during this season of Lent? Well, one way is by raising our sense of awareness. Uh, when we think about wilderness, we think of it as something far away. Maybe if we think about some, it's something close by, it can, it can help us engage it more fully. Wilderness raises our curiosity about stuff. We see something like a little hole in the railing of our porch and we think where did that come from what is that about what made that the beauty and new growth of the wilderness or of nature also awakens in us a sense of appreciation and a way of uh, receiving that as a gift and then we're also inspired by nature it awakens our creativity it helps us think more broadly about how things work together or how we might work differently in the world and be part of the world in a different way 
So awareness, curiosity, appreciation, and inspiration. Those are some of the parts of what a wilderness spiritual practice might look like, and we're going to explore those more fully. So first, let's talk about awareness. This is an, an exercise for you to do. So I invite you to pause the video for a second here and grab a piece of paper and maybe some crayons or some pens, or if all you have is a pencil, that'll be fine too. Um, colors are helpful here, but they're not required. Um, and I really encourage you to participate in this activity because it helps us think about how we are aware of things. So what I'm gonna ask you to do is to draw a daffodil from memory. I want you to make the drawing and describe it on paper as if you were explaining a daffodil to someone who'd never seen one. Now, there are a whole bunch of daffodils out in the spring. We've had a lot here in Nashville, although some of them have gone, but it's a time of year where hopefully a lot of us have seen daffodils recently. So this is also sort of a test to remember, do you know what a daffodil looks like? What are the petals like? What color are they? How many are there? What are the leaves like? How big are they? What shape are they? How tall is a daffodil? How does it grow? What comes out of the ground first? What, uh, where do daffodils appear? Do they come out one at a time or a whole bunch together? Are they singular? Are they in clumps? Are they on a bush? And I gotta say, I don't wanna hear, I can't draw. Draw anyway, no one's watching. You're home by yourself. But I invite you to try and draw it just to test your memory. It doesn't matter if it looks beautiful or not. This is a memory exercise. And if you can't finish the drawing or you're unsatisfied with your drawing, I, I encourage you to go ahead and use words to describe what you haven't captured so you can draw those on the page. So pause the video here, go ahead and make that drawing, and then you can start it again when you've finished your drawing. Okay, I'm going to assume that you've done your drawing now, and to help you out, I'm going to show you this. Here's a daffodil. So think about how how this daffodil compares with what you drew, not in terms of the quality of your drawing, but in terms of how much you remember and what did you miss? So when you were thinking about a daffodil from memory, did you forget how many petals it were? Did you, it had, did you know how many petals it had? What are you noticing now that you see a picture of it? What is it? What did you not notice before? What did you remember clearly and what didn't you remember clearly? This is all part of an exercise of awareness. It's a spiritual practice of stopping to smell the, smell the roses, to look at the actual thing in front of us and notice it and pay attention. And wilderness, the idea of wilderness can help raise our awareness of the things around us, like beautiful flowers coming out in the spring. So here's another example. This is a picture of a house I bought in 2013 when I first moved to Nashville. It was the first house I ever owned. And one of the things I was excited about was gardening because I'd never had a garden before. I'd always been in an apartment as an adult, but there was just one problem. So the South is known for snakes and I do not like snakes. Even before I moved in, I heard workers talking about seeing a snake in my yard and it just scared me to death because I don't like snakes and there are actually venomous snakes in, in Nashville, well, in Tennessee, and I just didn't know what to expect. I sort of expected them to be all over the place. But I moved in in October, and fortunately it was getting cold enough that the snakes went away for the winter and I didn't see them. So that was great, and I had some time to get used to the idea. And I figured that's okay. Spring will come around, and hopefully I can just avoid them. Well, spring came, and I had this beautiful little azalea bush next to my front porch, and I thought, great, I'm going to sit on my front porch way up high above this bush, above the ground where the snakes are, and I can sit on the porch and read a book and enjoy myself and not have to deal with snakes. So here's that azalea bush as you look down on it from the porch. It was a really nice uh, little bush there. Um, and here it is in bloom, but it turns out that I was not the only one who liked it. Here's a little garter snake friend who daily would climb up into the azalea bush and make himself comfortable, herself comfortable. It freaked me out. I didn't know that snakes could climb, for starters, and it was right next to me. Now, to be fair, this is a garter snake. It's not dangerous. I learned that because I went and did a bunch of research about snakes as soon as I had this encounter with this garter snake. And what happened was 
I got to know this particular snake and some others that lived under the um, walkway leading up to my house that would come out and sun themselves on my front walk. They were all garter snakes, all safe. But I got to know that they tended to come out when it was sunny, when it was about 65 degrees. That was sort of the temperature at which they'd come out and more or less what time of day they would come out because I got to know them so much. And I came to kind of appreciate them. I even named this one. This one I named Sister Mary Snake. And she would sit next to me in the azalea bush and I would have a lovely time um, just looking down at her. Now, of course, that's not all that happened because I also bought a big pair of boots and I wore gloves and I got a hat cover like this for the bugs because the mosquitoes turned out to be fierce. Here's a picture of me with my mosquito net hat on before I went out to fight some wasps. So the curiosity I had about this snake that led me to learn about it also led me to know where my limits were and to prepare myself for actual encounters. But my awareness of the snake being next to me led me to be curious about it. And the curiosity led me to learn in such a way that I could sort of stand it being there and actually even anticipate it being there and maybe even enjoy seeing it show up. So another thing about Nashville is there are a lot of bugs and curiosity led me to learn about bugs because when I first moved to Nashville, I learned that there were a bunch of bugs that can bite you and cause all kinds of problems and I was afraid of them. So one day in my kitchen sink, I found this and it terrified me. I was like, um, no, what is this thing? I don't want to deal with it. What is it? But my curiosity got the better of me. So I looked it up. This is what it's called. I think it's Scutagera coleoptot trotta or something like that. It's a house centipede. And as scary as it looks, it turns out that it eats spiders, bed bugs, termites, cockroaches, silverfish, ants, and other household bugs. So then I was like, oh yeah, this is great. This bug is good. I'm going to let it live. And now I leave them when I see them, although I will prefer them to be outside. So I tend to take them outside. As you can see, this one's in a glass and it's about to go outside. But there are a lot of bugs in Nashville. And some of them are beautiful. And my curiosity about bugs led me to start taking pictures of them as I saw them. So these are all bugs that were in my yard in the last few years. Some of them are very strange and confusing. And some of them look like art deco. And some of them are absolutely critical for our ecosystem to make sure that we have food and that the plants get pollinated and that we can survive. There was a podcast in December of 2014 that I listened to about nature and how much nature is worth. And one of the things curiosity can do is make us think about meaning of things and worth of things. And this particular podcast was about the price tag of nature. So the the podcast asked, what is the annual economic value of nature and the processes of ecosystems? So this would include things like pollination, composting, cleaning the air and water, eating other insects, providing fertilizer, tourism, things that, that grow, that, um, that nature provides that we want to go see, um, water, preventing water erosions, on and on. Some scientists looked at a, base, a bunch of studies and they calculated that the entire value is something like $142.6 trillion each year, which is more than all the gross national products of the whole world combined. Of course, this is a hard thing to calculate because um, natural processes are sort of difficult to, um, to know exactly what they're worth. But it's an interesting way of thinking about uh, what nature is worth and what it does for us. Of course, the question is, can we calculate the value of nature like this? Does a bee equal a certain amount of money? But still, the idea here is that our curiosity can help us think differently about what value things hold for us. Uh, because just the fact that something is interesting can be of value. And of course, all this shows us that we're just interconnected with everything else. The nature around us, the wilderness around us, makes it possible for us to breathe, for us to eat, for us to live. And we're, we live in houses made out of wood that came from trees or bricks that came from soil. So we are inter interconnected with the nature around us. 
So that helps us think about curiosity. Here's my garden and how it leads to appreciation that we can appreciate what wilderness and nature have to offer. So for example, the beauty of the things themselves is something to appreciate and the unimaginable roles they play in the natural world around us or the things they do for us, eating pests, pollinating flowers and blossoms, spreading seeds, turning up the soil, creating compost, making beauty and growth and food possible. All these things are ways to appreciate nature around us, even bugs. So I found this quote um, as part of that Radiolab podcast. In a way, all this diversity that's out there, all this biological diversity, all these wonderful and amazing and alien things that other species can do is like an extension of our own brains. There's so much imagination out there that we simply could not come up with on our own, that we can think of it as a pool of imagination and creativity from which we as humans are able to draw. And when we draw down on that proof of creativity and a pool of creativity and imagination, we deeply impoverish ourselves. You know, in a sense, we are doing harm to our own ability to think and to dream. So the idea is when we don't have that pool of creativity and imagination around us in nature and wilderness, we don't have as much as we could have for our own imaginations, our own ability to think and to dream. And that leads us to inspiration, from appreciation to inspiration. Nature provides us with imagination that allows us to think and dream in ways we might not have come up with ourselves. Some of you may be familiar with the artist Andy Goldsworthy. He's from Scotland and he does art in nature and it's designed to be made with natural elements that will then return back to nature. So for instance, he does things with leaves and the colors of leaves or with sticks and rocks. Here he's made a stick sculpture in water so you can see it's reflected in the water. Only half of it is actually above the water and the other half is a reflection. And here he's sort of stunningly taken some yellow leaves and put them on this wood, just with water, just with the moisture that was there. This is a little video of his showing a, an outdoor art project he did in his native Scotland. Oh, nice. Bit of frost on the ground. Stayed remarkably long. You must have um, extra thick skin on the bottom of your feet, Andy. <laughs> no. I, don't, I, don't, I, like, I love the cold. I can work anywhere and there are great landscapes everywhere. You know, any landscape is a, it can offer me something to work in. The people here have shown a great tolerance and uh, at times interest in what I do. And, you know, I don't work on my own fields either. I only have a six acre field in front of my house. I depend on their goodwill to some extent and their uh, allow tolerance to allow me to work in these places. It doesn't bother you that no one ever sees or very few people ever see this part of your work, the real part, the core. You may think this is a, a fairly isolated, secluded spot. Probably more people visit here than uh, artist studios. You know, and at any time, a, a group of Hikers, walkers, farmers can walk by me. And unlike in a studio, they can ask you what you're doing and come down and, you know, and examine it. So the intention with work like this is that I really don't know what I'm going to do. It's about looking and learning and seeing and responding to the day, the materials, and trying to understand a little bit of that day, that material, that place, that moment. Well, I'm here to help you. Let's well, go. Once I decide what I'm doing, you may be... Actually, you can bring those couple of branches there that I, I just picked up. What's interesting about 
And in fact, what is interesting about this whole place? It's a place that I actually walked by for many, many years. It doesn't seem a lot, but when you get inside of it, many of the trees here are dead. And eventually they fall and collapse. So there's a huge, heavy sense of uh, death and decay in this place. The amazing thing is that when it falls in, the elm trees fall into the water, they create these amazing waterfalls to be worked in. And because they're made not of rock, but of branches, it means you can kind of stick things into it, which I could never do with a rocky waterfall. So that's the kind of things that I'm trying to, I'm trying to think of getting something that could be almost suspended miraculously in front of this water. To be honest, I think the chances of this succeeding are pretty slight. So, you know, that said, okay. uh, we're if you can try and find any uh, curled, curved, smallish branches, just, just look around at the elm. Pieces like this? Yeah, pieces like a bit thicker maybe. Whatever yeah. you can find. No sooner said than done. All right. It is driven fundamentally by intuition. This part of my work, you know, this is the food, this is the nourishment, this is what gives um, and feeds all the other things that I do in exhibitions, permanent works, uh, outdoor installations, whatever. This is like the, the source. Oh, well, I need both. That's you, isn't it? Marvellous. Terrific. That's what particularly Great. good. Just pop them down there. Look at that. Can you find any more? Do you want some more? Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it's just, you know, the, all this decay that's created this place allowed me to make this and so much beauty come out of that, that process of change and decay. Every so often when you get a, 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 a big flood, the whole landscape of the, the stream bed changes completely. And it's such a huge sense of loss when you come to a place like this that I've worked on before and it's been washed away. You know, it's no longer there. Rocks that have been moved, trees that have been blown down. It's really unsettling, really unnerving. And then it all starts up again? Then it all starts up again, yeah. Never the same as before. Always a different place, you know? A good one, isn't it? I bet you're pleased with that, Andy. Yeah, I am, actually. So this brings us back to spiritual practices in the wilderness. All of these different things that we hold together as we think about wilderness can be grounded in these different ways of seeing them. How do they awaken our awareness, our curiosity, our appreciation, our inspiration? Maybe you might have some experiences of wilderness, uh, literal wilderness, being out in nature that have awakened one of these in you, awareness or curiosity or appreciation or inspiration. And we know that all these things continue to remind us of our interconnectedness, that we are part of something bigger, that we depend on it, and to some extent it depends on us. So we engage in interconnectedness as part of our spiritual practice as we think about penance and restoration and repair how is our connection with the wilderness connected to these things as part of Lent? Our repentance that is 
turning toward repair and toward making things right because we are interconnected with one another? And how are these things dependent upon each other? I'll end with this quote from that same man who I quoted earlier, who was on the podcast, J.B. McKinnon. He says, the rewilding of the human being, its ecology as part of identity. This rewilding, it's about as close as we can come, I think, to understanding what Thoreau really meant when he said, in wildness is the salvation of the world. It's a way to think about this idea of wilderness, the rewilding of the human being. Because wildness is in, is in us and is the salvation of the world because of our interconnectedness with it. So thank you for joining me for this class. I Oops, looked like I got cut off a little bit there. Sorry about that. I'm using new software that I'm getting used to. But thank you for joining me for this class. Um, I hope that this is a way for you to think differently about wilderness and Lent and how our interconnectedness to the world is um, intertwined with things like our penance and our repentance and restoration and repair for ourselves, for our own souls, for our relationships with God, and for our relationships with one another and the whole of creation. Here are some of the sources that I used for today's class. Thanks again for joining me.